When you come to consider why civilizations rise and what makes them fail, archaeology affirms that it's, it's something that comes from the natural setting in which those people live. If you have abundant water and you have a diverse range of plants and animals to domesticate, you can start to manage nature. You can uh, build up such a food supply that instead of having the zero population growth that typifies all original hunting and gathering societies, now you can have many children and in fact you need many children because you're farmers now and you need the children to bring in the harvest and watch the sheep and the goats and uh, carry the food to the place where it will be dried or processed. It's work for many hands for the first time in human history. So suddenly there's a situation where there's a landscape being remodeled according to human needs, the wild pushed further and further away beyond the horizon. In many cases, big rivers are winding their way through, such as the Nile, the Tigris, the Euphrates, the Indus, uh, the rivers, great rivers of, of China, the uh, Yangtze and the Yellow uh, come to America, and the Mississippi River had uh, great cities along its banks, although modern Americans tend to forget them. And then those crops, uh, wheat in the Mediterranean world, wheat and barley, uh, millet and rice in the east and in the south, corn in the Americas, all of these suddenly provide calories in superabundance for a minimal amount of effort. We think of farming as very hard work, but in fact, it's work that suddenly calls for bursts of activity and many hands at certain times of the year, but results in a food surplus that allows many more people to live and some people to begin to develop that work of civilization. The ones who will be sky watchers, uh, specialized warriors, devisers of laws, uh, people who process plant and animal products and stone into beautiful art, uh, the architects who will build uh, the early temples and then houses, the city planners, uh, weavers of cloth, all of this begins to come with a great rush as the, the abundance of the food supply, which was the trigger, allows people to stop being 100% committed to the pursuit of the next meal and suddenly are free. The civilization begins to rise. Typically civilizations arise in a competitive atmosphere. You're not the only group of people in that favored environment and you are immediately, because of the expansion, rubbing shoulders against the others. And militarism has been the universal human response to this. Young men who seem to be born with a gene for wanting to take risks and not caring if they come out of a situation alive or, or not really being able to focus on that, they're your perfect warriors. So you suddenly have a hedge of young men with spears or swords or arrows around your, your periphery. You've got the uh, communities, the cities, the, the mass of the population inside, and you're at war with your neighbors. And out of this matrix begin to come these complex religions which have to do with the value of life and death, the service to a god, a, a god being located within a community, and suddenly a focus on the land that hasn't been there before. Typical hunting and gathering religions uh, do not have supreme deities in complicated theology. They are what we call animism, um, and it's still around, and we all have it to some extent. The idea that everything in this earth has a soul, a spirit, uh, whether it's a lake or a rock or an oak tree or an animal. There's something in there that is just as much a soul as what is inside my body. And so out of that, our hunting ancestors crafted their religion, which survives in us as superstition, as we call it. But for them, it was a way of gaining control over the natural world. So you would tame the spirit of a great beast before you went out to try to hunt it through your magic ceremonies. For the the raisers of, of the grain and the wheat and the, the uh, corn and the rice and the millet, uh, they are into long-term planning in a way that hunters and gatherers never were. Uh, hunters and gatherers lived from one meal to the next, from one kill to the next. They didn't typically have ways to preserve the food and then have multiple days of leisure following a big kill. But the farming people are now in an annual cycle where after the seed is in the ground, you have days upon days when a lot of the people can be freed up to do something else after the harvest is over. Days, months, where the whole community knows its food supply is there and the young men know it's their job to protect it so it won't be ruined or, or broken into or stolen by enemies. 
And it's in those times that life begins to diversify, like uh, life in a rainforest as festivals, uh, new professions, uh, new tricks of language, uh, complexities of social ranking leading to an elite with elaborate um, uh, status symbols that have been manufactured for them by the artists who want to adorn the bodies of the men and women at the top of the pyramid with beautiful things so everyone knows these are our gods on earth. And out of all of that then begins to come what we think of as religions which are bodies of belief, of rituals, of prayers and chants and songs, and as I said, the idea that the surface of the earth now offers you sacred places within your realm, a place for an oracle, a place for a temple, a place for an altar, and you will now create a sacred landscape within your own uh, area. And this is one thing that really sets off modern civilizations from our, our ancient ancestor civilizations, the biggest single things, the biggest single targets of effort and ingenuity are sacred places for the gods and for the ancestors who are now buried under the earth and may have something as large as a megalithic monument on top to show my ancestor is here, here is the immovable monument to the ancestors, here is my annual ceremony of reverence, of offering them the, the food and drink they need to keep on living, and their mighty spirits are protecting this land. and staking my claim to this land. If it's my ancestors' land, that's why it's mine. And now land matters. Hunters and gatherers were mobile. They moved across landscapes. Farmers can't do that. They stay put. Something's got to justify why this land is mine. So religion grows out of all of this, and then the lawgivers arrive, arise who, uh, through religious prescripts, will begin to uh, build in codes of law. Uh, things like the Ten Commandments, uh, very familiar to Christians in the Bible, but all religion tends to get into law, uh, behavior as well as what you need to do for the gods to, to keep them happy. So in this way, a grand, complicated, flourishing, beautiful, warlike machine arises filled with people. And its great uh, uh, failures, I would say, come from three directions. The first is the land that gave it birth. Agricultural peoples are mighty hard on their environments. Soil can be exhausted. Uh, stripping away the original forest cover can cause erosion and, and carry the soil away to the sea. Uh, rivers can become polluted or, or flood because the trees are no longer there to evenly balance the, the dispersal of the rainwater. So with um, droughts, with uh, the resulting famines, uh, civilizations can be ruined. Land can be rendered unfit. Uh, Mesopotamia was a garden. Now, uh, through uh, thousands of years of early farmers irrigating through uh, ditches, uh, the water left its salts behind and the land has been poisoned. And so the, the earth that gave them rise turned against them and they had to move, find other places for their cities. So you poison or, or disrupt the natural cycle as agriculture must, that can turn on you. And so archaeologists typically first look for the climatic change, the uh, rainfall change, the, the, the soil and landscape changes that could have uh, ruined that, that territory for the people that lived in it. The second thing is the warfare. Um, it's good for team spirit, it's good for taking the, the head of steam off all the young men, so now they're turning their aggressions outward instead of inward on feuding, but you often end up uh, meeting neighboring farmers who got the jump on you who have bigger territory or use it better and whose young men are that little bit more dynamic than yours, now you become enslaved to them. Your own culture is suppressed. Uh, you become serfs to uh, another group. When the, the Spanish arrived in, in Mexico, the conquest of the Aztecs was easy because they built up an empire by conquering neighboring tribes and agricultural peoples under a super Aztec empire. But most of the population hated the Aztecs because their own cultures, their own civilizations, had been suppressed under this empire. And the third way is what I can only call a, a, a rot from within. A civilization produces certain diseases. Uh, and I don't mean microbes, although it does that too. Uh, civilized people are sometimes less healthy than their hunting and gathering ancestors were. But there is a disease of complacency. There's a disease of abundance where you have so much that the drive that your ancestors felt to build up that civilization becomes entirely lacking. 
what's the need for drive when your most serious concern is the next dance or festival or, or acquisition of a beautiful status symbol? Uh, these great forms and rituals begin to take in. People's lives become an, an elaborate dance pattern of movements within the society and the, the religious framework. Um, and to me, that's the most interesting thing. We can certainly see in a mechanical way why warfare, why environmental de um, deterioration would, would carry away civilization. But when there is this uh, universal tradition of, of the rot, uh, in government it takes the form of uh, bureaucracy, where more and more people are employed in the government, doing in essence less and less, uh, but moving masses of information and, and uh, ideas around. It's just not a healthy thing. And the form became, be, begins to take over from the substance as what the, the people focus on, is the forms, the ever more elaborate forms. Uh, I think this is partly what carried off the Maya, is the, is the utter complexity of their society. Um, and the, the, the windows that brought in all the fresh air gradually get closed one by one. And it does go stale. And there comes a time when people stop believing in it. And when I look back at the Roman Empire, it's clear to me that late on, among the emperors of the, the third century already, and certainly in the fourth, a lot of people have just stopped believing that it matters, that it's a good thing. There's no will to live, and that giant organism that we call the civilization can, in an unbelievably short period of time, disappear from the face of the earth. What fascinates me about the Vikings is that we can pinpoint one technological advance that suddenly enables a nascent civilization to go global. And that advance was putting onto their traditional watercraft, which I studied in my graduate years and which I could trace back to a Bronze Age and Stone Age set of ancestors thousands of years before the Vikings. It had never had a, a tradition of putting keels onto the ships. And if you don't have a keel, unless you have an outrigger, as the Polynesians invented for their canoes, you cannot raise a sail. Only human power will move your ships, which is very limiting. And it also limits how high the ships can be, how, how much of a ship and how much it can carry, because oars and paddles uh, must bring the rowers down close to the water. So suddenly, with this uh, innovation, sometime in the 8th century, the 700s of our era, um, Almost overnight, uh, we see that the keels appear, the masts raise, the sails spread, and the Vikings are all over the map. So here's a, a technical innovation. The curiosity is they had seen ships with sails among Romans, among Celts on the North Sea for centuries, and just decided that's not who we are. We are not the people who go around with sailing ships and they were living in a world where their sleek, little, low, hard to catch war canoes were all they needed. But uh, there seems to have come along at the same time as this, um, this adoption of the keel and the sail, and therefore of long distance, far ranging uh, exploration and raiding. Uh, it seems to have come at the same time as an economic threat. Uh, the, the Frankish empire to the south, uh, created by Charlemagne, and Charlemagne will crown him, will be crowned by the Pope on Christmas Day in the year 800, which is within a couple of years of the rise of the, the Vikings. Um, and he will start a new policy. Uh, wealth is for Christians. The trade with the, the northern kingdoms, who are all pagan at that point, will wither. And suddenly, these uh, Vikings, who had been getting trade goods from as far away as India and Arabia, uh, Buddhas are found in pre-Viking uh, trading settlements in in uh, Sweden and, and Norway, um, suddenly they're starving for all the goods that they've come to expect for their highly stratified society. All the rich people want these, these things and suddenly they don't have them. Life isn't what it was. Well, if you can't get it by trade, you will take it by warfare. And it may be that the early phases of this uh, uh, economic revolution and, and denial of them of, to them of what they, they have come to need uh, that that may have spurred the shipbuilders to find a way to get them out of home waters and make themselves a force in the rivers of Russia so they could uh, go up the rivers from the Baltic, portage over to the rivers that ran down to the Caspian and the Black Sea, and get around the Frankish Empire, do an end run around Charlemagne and his troublesome armies, and get what they wanted, these treasures of the East and of the Mediterranean, 
at the source. At the same time, Danes and Norwegians, while the Swedes were going east, were going west into the Atlantic. Uh, Britain had uh, powerful Saxon kings with tremendous treasures from raiding monasteries. It, it was a short step for these Vikings, who are now in these perfect ships for conquest, very shallow draft. Uh, they can go up any river, any creek in Europe and bring a load of uh, heavily armed warriors to an unsuspecting site, uh, knock it off, raid, pillage, loot, yes, rape, burn, carry things home, uh, terrorize so the population won't try to resist them in the future. Vikings did not like to face standing armies. They are, they're not looking for standard warfare. They are uh, hit and run raiders and are so wildly successful, but they weaken some of these kingdoms so much that they get a foothold. All of Northeast Britain becomes a, a Viking Romaine called the Dane Law. Uh, other kingdoms like Normandy, or realms like Normandy, of ultimately a duchy in the French system, that's Northman country. And that's where a Dane named Rollo led a lot of Norwegian Vikings and they settled down, married local girls. They took over the island of Iceland. There'd apparently been some Irish there before. Now it's a Viking realm. Greenland, a little uh, settlement in America on Newfoundland. And then uh, modern Russia probably descends from a great Viking realm, the, the realm of the Rus, R-U-S, the red-headed Swedish Vikings. Um, in uh, the area around Kiev. So they are kingdom creators, but you can't be Vikings, either at home or abroad, and really make sense of a nationalist, stable kind of government. So the Vikingism very quickly goes under, and the society and culture undergoes a radical change as they get this new land, intermarry with the local women, and settle down. Regardless of how things go for our civilization in coming years, I'm not optimistic about how my descendants of 2,000 years in the future will look back and view me, my world. We live in an information age where the information is coded into electronic devices, into clouds floating out there somewhere in an imaginary cyberspace. None of that will be available. Uh, E-books will not be read by the people of 2,000 years in the future. They just won't be. So our literature will be gone, our technology uh, getting more and more into the realm of the, the digital and the, the uh, virtual rather than the real. That will be gone. They, they can find the hardware, but it will be meaningless. They'll understand that we had complex message systems, but everything that gives our, our lives, life and breath and sap and blood, there won't be a record of it for people of the future to read. Uh, and then they will, they will focus on the fact of the, uh, this is the second thing I think they will see, more trash and garbage production than any other human society before us. Uh, everything for us comes in a wrapper. Sometimes the wrapper is bigger than the thing itself, certainly more indestructible. The hamburger that comes in the great styrofoam box that is used for two minutes to get the hamburger from the grill into your hands, to the table, and then into the trash box. That little styrofoam container can be around for millennia. And so that's what will show up, is the billions of these containers smashed together in landfills. Uh, they, they'll be, be able to reconstruct our consumption patterns as if we were a, a society of just animals at the feeding trough. But the higher side, and I like to think there is a higher side, that is going to vanish. We are preservers of other people's arts. We create these special houses we call museums for the display of great artworks from the past and a few new ones of our own. Uh, uh, my favorites of our creations, the great glass and steel skyscrapers and the bridges, they're not going to last. The, 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 the girders will rust, the glass will fall to the, the pavements. Uh, they may find pictures of what we've left behind. They'll find documentation, especially from the earlier 20th century and before, because our, our ancestors of a few generations back built much more to last. But basically, we're not going to look very interesting. We're going to seem like parasites both on the past of our own world and the planet. Uh, they will be able to tell that there was no civilization like us for uh, imprinting with a massive footprint our appetites on the natural world that we are living off of and rapidly overeating and destroying. So whatever comes after, uh, they will have a bad impression of us anyway as the ones who wrecked in certain ways that can't be fixed parts of this planet. And uh, I'm sure they'll be pretty judgmental. Uh, people talk about the human race not surviving. I think the human race will survive. It'll be uh, a reduced 
a remnant who will learn to live in balance with their environment. That's been learned before in the human past. There have been uh, great civilizations in places like Mesopotamia that ultimately yielded village societies, as did Egypt, uh, rather than great cities and huge um, ambitious uh, communal projects like the pyramids or the ziggurats. Uh, people have had to learn we won't be able to do what our ancestors did. We will have to le live in the shell, the diminished shell of the world that they left behind. I'm afraid I see us as one of those uh, civilizations that will be succeeded by a long uh, era of societies for whom life is much less abundant and much harder than it's been for us. The most remarkable recent discovery for the uh, CSI teams of archaeology is in Turkey and it has only, only partially been solved, if we want to think of it as a, a place where something momentous happened and we're trying to reconstruct the, the crime or the, the, the activity there. It's in Turkey, eastern Turkey, near the headwaters of the Euphrates River, so near that place where the first great cities will rise. But it is 7,000 years older than those first great cities. It is a stone monument that is as if one had taken seven small stone hinges and put them all together. It's great standing stones with lintel stones across the top. It is currently the world's oldest stone architecture on a monumental scale, and it's called Gubekli Tepe, which means in Turkish, Pot Belly Hill. We don't know its ancient name because the people who built it, those people of 12,000 years ago, are lost to us, and no bones have been found there. This was not a place of burial. It was not a place where people lived. Uh, we don't find the remains of food, we don't find the remains of dwelling places or, or craft industries. It's clear that the local stone, which is a limestone, can be worked fairly easily. But what sets this apart from Stonehenge, which seems so monumental and extraordinary, is that already all over the surfaces of these stones are not painted animals, as in the hunter's caves of tens of thousands of years earlier in Western Europe, but now animals carved in bold relief coming out of the stone at you. Dogs, wild boars, strange feline figures, uh, people, but people in a, in a very sophisticated, stylized uh, presentation. Rows of ducks walking along the bottom of a, bottom of a, a pedestal. Uh, great complexity and sometimes the, the great slab-like uprights become in themselves people with arms down the sides and you can even see the fingers around the edges. What the heck is this thing? It's not a place of sacrifice. There aren't altars. We don't find the remains of, of sacrificial objects. Um, so in this case, all those uh, investigative techniques that I like to talk about with my students have yielded, for the most part, nothing. The places where we expect to find the clues, there are no clues. So what will be turned to next is the battery of scientific techniques for taking the soil apart in which it is buried. Uh, they've already extracted, the German and Turkish archaeologists working there, some charcoal from around the, the bases of these upright stones. And that has given us this date of 10,000 years in the past. And in fact, as I discovered when I visited it, there are three other sites like this. And some of them have been uh, buried, uh, submerged behind the, the, the dams that Turkey is busy building around the Euphrates Valley um, and the water rises in the lake and now Nevali Chori, for instance, one of the other sites is, is now underwater. So it's not a, an isolated supernova that we can't explain. It's par part of a tradition and when we think about what, what role animals played in our ancestors' lives, it's um, often as totems, the idea that animal spirits are not just antagonists but ancestors of humans and that's how you get the idea of a wolf clan or a a cave bear clan or a deer clan. So uh, to see a great ups, upright slab, which certainly seems to be an object of veneration, which would be if you were under the roof or in the enclosure, the dominant thing in your visual world at that point, we seem to be looking at an image of great power and something that is not menacing, something that the people have adopted and embraced. So it seems to be a, a gathering place, a meeting place. Uh, if you look at modern tribal peoples who were documented before they were pushed to extinction, it's clear that they often had sacred places away from the main centers of dwelling and, and work and, and living, and that in these remote places they would come at certain times of the year for gigantic gatherings. 
often a tribe that had dispersed, would come back to the ancestral place for a grand family reunion once a year. Uh, this happened in the American Southwest at a uh, place called Chaco Canyon, where Pueblo Bonito. Here was the biggest structure in that world, but nobody lived there most of the year. It was the meeting place. So this is my own belief that if we add to our, our uh, toolkit the examples, the parallels from other, other civilizations, we, be, we can begin to see. But it will be the, the soil scientists who get in and get every grain of pollen, every seed from the mass of soil that was in and around these stones, will be able to start to reconstruct the environment. It is my humble belief we are going to find that the women of these societies were already experimenting with the plant foods. Women are always the ones in charge of the plants. The plants stay put. Women who need to deal with small children and childbearing naturally claim the plant world as their, their sphere. Plants are always, except among the Inuit or other Arctic people, they're always providing more of the family's food than the, the men's bringing in of the game and the animals, but the, that protein is very necessary for the muscles and the, the strength. So it's a good symbiosis. I believe that we will, this is pure speculation, that um, the women had already made huge strides. Uh, we're getting the early harvest, not necessarily uh, staying put, but maybe walking through the natural landscape and, um, and uh, gathering them, and that we will be able to solve this mystery of how could a seemingly primitive hunting society raise a staggering stone monument.